Welcome to this edition of American Purpose. My name is Jack Moline and I am president of Interfaith Alliance. Sixty years ago, Henry Luce, publisher of Life magazine, invited ten prominent men, each to compose an essay on the national purpose. Then as now, there was a sense that we stood at the beginning of a time of cultural and political change. Our project expands on this work as each episode explores one perspective of where our nation was, where it is, and where it should be heading with a contemporary thought leader. My guests are from the world of faith, government, politics, and culture, and they have generously agreed to share this time with us. You can find out more about Interfaith Alliance and our mission to protect your faith and freedom by visiting uh, interfaithalliance.org and by listening to our radio program and podcast, State of Belief, at stateofbelief.com. But right now, let's find out more about the American purpose with my guest, Maggie Siddiqui. Maggie is the Senior Director of Faith and Progressive Policy Initiative at the Center for American Progress. Her role is focused uh, on advancing a progressive vision of faith and religious liberty and engaging a network of faith leaders. She is a uh, certified uh, Islamic chaplain uh, from Hartford Seminary and has experience working at the Georgetown University Hospital. And uh, Maggie, I know you are proficient in both Spanish and German, and I can assure you, you will not have to use either one in this conversation. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Maggie, we're just going to get right to the questions. In your opinion, what was the original national purpose of the United States? It's a small question. Um, well, this, the story we learned in history class is that the, the project called America was be about creating a land of opportunity, living free from oppression, having true equality, um, having the freedom of religion, all very beautiful ideals. Um, but we know this project was also created by becoming the oppressors, by enslaving, persecuting, and killing enslaved Africans and indigenous peoples, by suppressing all of their freedoms, um, including the freedom of religion. So like many good ideas, when they are put into practice, uh, it was an utter failure from the start in that sense. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to clarify, mm -hmm. you're not suggesting that it was the purpose of the United States to uh, to uh, kill uh, Africans no. and indigenous people, but that the purpose devolved into that in yes. pursuit of its own justification. Exactly. So but, like, exactly, like all good, good ideas when put into practice, uh, <laughs> falling very, very short of those ideals. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you believe is or ought to be the American purpose going forward? Um, well, in, in many ways, the same uh, as flawed as our ability to live out our national purpose has been. Those are the same kind of ideals that I hope we can put into reality moving forward. Um, as individuals, our, life, our lives in this world are nothing if not an act of constant striving toward a kind of perfection we know we can never quite achieve. Um, the saints among us get quite close to that perfection. I think as individuals, we often strive toward that saintliness. And similarly, I think as a collective, as a nation, we ought to strive uh, to the most perfect version of those ideals that we hold dear, even if and when we constantly fall short. Um, those ideals being that of, of equality and freedom of oppression and all of that that I just mentioned. Do you think it's possible? Uh, I, I, um, yes. I mean, I think uh, to quote um, Ustad Abedullah Evans, uh, who's at the American Learning Institute of Muslims, um, he's, he said about the distinction between hope and optimism, I don't have any optimism. A serious read of our history and a serious assessment of our current reality does not lend itself to optimism, but I am a faithful, hopeful person. Um, and so similarly, I think as a as a uh, um, a person of faith, I have to believe, um, I have to have faith that a better version of ourselves is possible, that it is worth it to keep striving, that we can actually get there. Um, I think a serious read of history makes me question that and feel a little bit less optimistic about that. 
Um, but I, I, I have to believe that that's possible. I have to be able to, to envision that world that I'm striving toward and, and work toward that every day. Hope is an occupational hazard for people of faith. <laughs> Absolutely. So Maggie, our, our society rests on certain foundational values. Some of them are admirable and others are not so much. What are one or two values that are worth doubling down on in our society? Um, yeah, th this democratic ideal in our society that says all people are equal, therefore all people deserve equal votes, equal voice, equal access to opportunity. Um, it's a value that leads us to embrace a kind of pluralism, a kind of inclusion that I think is so desperately needed in our society, in our world. And it's one that we should keep striving toward. It's, it can be a guiding principle and our daily life and how we treat our neighbors and in how we approach matters of um, public policy. It's it's something that I think we should absolutely keep front and center as we move forward. Um, it should lead us to uh, a sense of non-judgment and humility in humility in terms of how we approach one another. Um, the idea that all people, regardless of their differences, should be treated equally in the eyes of the in the law, uh, the eyes of the law and the eyes of society. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there are significant portions of the population who've been left out of this ideal, usually quite intentionally, but that also means, to, to have this sort of more hopeful view of it, that that means there is opportunity for progress. We know where we are falling short, and so therefore we know where we need to strive better, uh, to do better. There's, um, uh, for example, um, amongst the communities that have been historically left out. Um, I'm going to quote somebody else <laughs> again. Pastor Tracy Blackman, um, you know, noted that the framing of democracy for this nation was not conceived in anything other than whiteness, that black people have always had to, to make a way out of whatever they were given in this country. Um, and therefore that we should listen to, to, to black Americans moving forward. And I thought that that was really powerful when she shared that because it was sort of noting a historical expertise that has been built up over centuries of a people who have been striving toward an ideal that they were not conceived as being a part of. Um, and so by, by listening to them and their expertise, we can find ways to progress moving forward. Um, and we can really double down on that value of, of equality and inclusion and find ways to make our democracy better as a result. Um, if we shift kind of who's at the center of that conversation. In, in that framing of America, um, there are people who have aspired to that whiteness, um, some of whom have had fewer immutable obstacles than the uh, African-American, the black community. My own community, for example, has aspired to whiteness, and in, in large measure, the Jewish community has succeeded in identifying uh, and promoting that ideal. Um, that's, I think, neither here nor there in terms of, of an objective description, but it does uh, sort of prove the point you're trying to make here, that, that that's the path to success in America, or at least it has been to this point. Um, uh, which brings me to the question about one or two of the foundational values that you think hold us back from making our necessary progress. I think the um, notion of freedom is one that we wrestle with a lot in this country. Um, it's certainly something that has come up in the context of the pandemic, but many other issues as well. What does it mean to be free? Um, and I, I think if if wrongly applied, we can very much <laughs> misinterpret what the purpose of that freedom is uh, in terms of the purpose of America. Um, this is hopefully my last quote. Sorry to keep quoting people, but they're just amazing. But they're not here and, and they can't stop it. <laughs> Who we in, we interviewed them for a, a report called the Pro-Democracy Faith Movement. And they shared, I think, such real, really powerful insights that are relevant to this conversation. Um, Reverend Marlon Lavonner, I want maybe mispronouncing his name, from Tulsa. Um, a friend of mine, by the way, who's oh, also, really? he's a Chicago Cubs fan, but go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I won't hold it against him, I guess. Um, 
he said there that he he sees you know this kind of like two two types of freedom right one is the don't tread on me type of freedom um, that's highly individualistic. It's about what are my needs and no one else's. And there is a collective type of freedom um, in which people strive to ensure that everyone's basic needs are met. And that that's the sort of conceptualism, uh, conceptualization of freedom that we should be leaning into, a type of freedom that allows me and allows everyone to live out their own dreams, to live out um, their lives in, in the best possible way. Um, but yeah, I think that's sort of, as many of us in the society have sort of taken that freedom in that don't tread on me direction. That's all about me, regardless of the impact on others. And if we keep going down that road, we're going to be in some real serious trouble. We already kind of are. A sort of hyper individualism is what you're talking about. Absolutely. Yep. So most of our constitutional guarantees try to emphasize our commonality, but like what you just described, the first freedom in the Bill of Rights is very personal. It's it's religion, freedom of conscience. Um, what are some of the values that are rooted in your personal belief system that you commend to those who do not share your beliefs? So I think in many ways, um, what I shared so far already contains many of those values. It is very uh, hard uh, and uh, to extract our um, faith beliefs from the other values that we hold dear. Um, that's a really that's important point I want to say. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've asked a lot of people this question, and uh, you're the first one to note, I think correctly, that they're not necessarily separable. But please go ahead. Well, to that point, I mean, what I said earlier about sort of this constant striving towards a, 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 and a sort of unachievable per perfection is essentially the notion of jihad in Islam, the sort of constant uh, spiritual striving. So um, very much shown up in what I've said so far. Um, another concept that I could share and for your audience that's been to many interfaith events with Muslims, they might be tired of, of hearing this one, but there's this notion rooted in the Quran that um, God created people to be different nations and tribes, different genders, even different religions. Um, and I think this idea that there's this great cosmic intentionality about the differences that exist among us is just a really beautiful idea that, at least for me, helps me kind of let go of who's right, who's wrong, who's better, who's worse, instead to really uh, center this notion of an ultimate truth that wholly transcends the way that we assess one another um, as individuals. And similarly, I think um, another Islamic idea uh, is that what makes us better than one another, according to God, is not even what religious tradition we belong to, but rather is our deeds on this earth. God asks us to compete with one another in, in good deeds. So. Uh, you know, if you want to be better <laughs> than, uh, the, than the person next to you, how are you showing that through your deeds? Do you show compassion for others? Are you honest and truthful with others and, and with yourself? Are you a good steward of the natural worlds? I mean, these are, these are ideals that I, I'm sure are not exclusive to Islam by any means, but ones that uh, I think are really informative for me and just in terms of my approach to, to some of these greater questions and matters of public policy. Rather than the Hunger Games, the Feed the Hungry Games. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, it's it, it's interesting, I was just listening to your answer to this and, and thinking about what you just said about hyper-individualism. Pluralism in our society uh, often depends on, uh, on these variety of opinions. In fact, uh, Mike Walzer, who I'm sure you're familiar with. If you can quote somebody, so can I. Uh, Michael Walzer says that liberal democracy is dependent on our various identities, that we, we, can't, we can't all pull together in the same direction, or there's none of the tension that creates uh, the, the necessary progress for democracy. How do you, how do you make that distinction between the, the undesirability of being too distinctive and individualistic and the desirability of maintaining that diversity. I know this That's wasn't really on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, 
You know, it's interesting because uh, there's a comparison, I think, that can be made to sort of notions of individual and collective salvation. Good. So I am a, uh, a part of a religion that believes in individual salvation. And so by necessity, there's a sort of individualistic approach that I have to take <laughs> um, that uh, ultimately what I believe I will be judged by is what I have done and what I believe in, not what we as a society have done and what we believe. But if I take that approach to an extreme and in my effort to achieve individual salvation, um, damage the collective let's say i uh, am exclusionary of people within my own religious community and lead them uh to lose uh to lose their their faith uh to 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 drift away from the religion well then what i've actually done um even though i'm i may not have that approach toward collective salvation i've hurt my own individual salvation right? Because I have done something harmful to others. I have made society worse. I have made my religious community worse. And so I think there's a, there's almost a self-interested way uh, to look at the need to, to, to kind of um, regulate our individualism. And I think similarly in matters of public policy, if we, uh, you know, say, take our freedoms to an extreme, if we say my I, I don't want a mask and I don't want a vaccine in the context of a deadly pandemic. Um, just to choose an example, just to choose an example, we can, uh, you know, affect other people who then infect our loved ones who then die. There is a way that that we have to sort of um, I don't know, this is exactly what you're asking here, but uh, that we need to regulate that sort of individualism in living in a diverse community. Um, so that we can actually benefit um, ourselves and the world around us. Good, thank you. That that's the perfect clarification. So, Maggie, how do you think our society should pursue our national purpose? How do we go about it? Well, I think a lot of what we can do as society is through as a society is through the um, bodies that govern us, through our public policy. Um, and so uh, some of these issues I've raised already for, you know, if we're intended, um, if we're intending to have a land of opportunity, then do we have an economy that works for all of us? Um, right now, I know Congress is considering a lot of different proposals around a child tax credit, around uh, paid leave, around uh, uh, tax fairness that uh, ensures that the economy is not just working for wealthy and corporation uh, and corporations. Um, if our society is intended to um, uh, pursue equality as its nat uh, national purpose, then do we have civil rights protections in place that are actually protecting everyone? Or do we need something like the Equality Act to ensure sexual orientation and gender identity are included in that? Um, are we closing gaps that exist beyond legal protections um, uh, to ensure that in this sort of lived reality that uh, all communities have equal uh, equal access to opportunity are treated equally, um, do not have disproportionate uh, bad health outcomes uh, when they when they get sick, um, and if we are intended to be a society that is freedom from oppression, including having the freedom of religion then do we have uh, sufficient civil rights protections in place? Are we, what are we doing to prevent another tree of life uh, mass shooting kind of an incident um, against houses of worship that are at risk of white supremacist violence? Uh, what are we doing to protect tribal lands that are even now um, continuing to be taken over by corporations and having sacred lands decimated um, by, uh, you know, co copper mining companies and, and the like. Um, all, all of that, right? Uh, they're, they're, it's no small feat, but there are so many public policies right now that I know are under 
consideration just to to help kind of align us better with that national purpose. So you're you're giving me an answer that is that is at its base, as you said, uh, government and policy is is the vehicle of this. What role does the individual play in pursuing our national purpose, assuming you're not a senator or a member of Congress? Well, first, I'll say that, you know, what is our nation except a collection of individuals? And so if we do want to see these things uh, happen in public policy, it's not just a matter of having your your representatives in Congress um, fulfill that duty. You have to be the, the one who chooses who's representing you in Congress, first of all. So um, vote. So vote. <laughs> and then also, um, following up with them and making sure that they are uh, doing their job and, and making sure that they're passing policies that are aligned with those ideals. So I think there's absolutely an individual role to play in public policy. And there, there is obviously, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, there's also an interpersonal role in terms of what it means to treat one another uh, fairly and, and with compassion and with respect. But I, I do think, uh, perhaps we don't place enough emphasis on the role that we as individuals have in shaping our nation's public policy. Can you can you talk just for a second about hearts and minds, how the how the individual can have an impact on that? Oh, yes. Uh, important point that um, public policy is only possible when the the culture of the society supports that that policy change. Um, and so if you do not have um, a society that supports an economy that works for all, uh, that supports there being non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people, just to pick examples of things I've mentioned already, um, then, then there's a lot as an individual that you can do as, um, as a member of of your own communities as a member of greater society to encourage others to see how these policies reflect those ideals that in theory they also share um, and to help advocate for those things to happen. So we come to the last question now, or at least the last question of this discussion um, that you've already sort of answered, but now I'm, I'm really putting it on the line. Are you optimistic about America's future? Yeah, as I sort of said earlier, you know, there's a difference between hope and optimism, right. uh, as is that Evan said. And so, you know, I I think um, it's been it's been a long road to get to the kind of progress we've achieved so far. Um, that makes me perhaps perhaps less optimistic about the timeline that we're operating on in terms of uh, getting some things, uh, you know, put into action. Some of these ideals put into action, but I think. Over the long run, um, as a person of faith, I am hopeful. I have to be, um, or I, or rather, I, I sort of am by definition someone who is constantly envisioning what the world could be and striving toward that. And when you can envision what that world could be, it makes it uh, feel achievable. It makes it something visible that you can strive toward. Um, and so I am hopeful about America's future. I do think that we have the ingredients there. We've come this far. Um, we can keep going. We'll get there one day, inshallah. Inshallah. And it's, uh, it's a great position to be in when you work for an organization named the Center for American Progress. Speaking of which, if people would like to know more about uh, CAP, about the Center for American Progress, and your work there, how can they find out about it? Sure, you can go to AmericanProgress.org. Um, we have an issue-specific page that is about our work on religion and religious freedom and the role of faith communities in advocacy. Um, and you can also follow that work on Twitter at CAPFaith. C-A-P-F-A-I-T-H. Correct. Spaces. Great. <laughs> Thank you to our listeners for engaging with us in exploring the American purpose. 
It's been an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with Maggie Siddiqui, who has shared her perspective so generously. You can listen to this and other episodes at AmericanPurpose.org and learn more about our work at StateOfBelief.com and InterfaithAlliance.org. Interfaith Alliance has produced this program under the guidance of Ray Kirstein. I am Jack Moline, encouraging you to live with purpose.